Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 1 series. Jesus Gives Personal Truth to Christiana and Graham Bates, filmed on the 12th of July 2014 in Monkeray, New South Wales, Australia. Well, I'm here today with Christiana and Graham, and I've invited them to be here today. Um, this is in the assistance group. It's our first, what I would call, facing personal truth session. <laughs> and uh, so they're not sure what to expect, and I suppose most of the people who are listening to us here in the audience wouldn't know what to expect either. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to raise some issues regarding the booking process that you guys went through uh, with Paige and Kerry, the people who are handling our bookings. And I don't know if you remember, but Christiana, of the two of you, you're the one that handled most of the interactions with Paige and Kerry, weren't you? That's right, yeah. yeah. And, um, and as a result of those interactions, there were times when you felt like you were getting attacked. Yes. Is that not true? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now... We, we had given them direct, as you now know, we had given them direct instructions to be very specific when something was wrong. And it's interesting that you felt like it was an attack. Now, if you felt like it was an attack, you could have just let that be and just felt like it's an attack and feel your way through the emotions, but you didn't choose to do that. No, what did you choose to do? I chose to attack back. Well, you chose to go a bit further than that, really, if you think about it. So let's go through the process of what, yeah. what you felt. Yeah. So. Um, I made an error when it, with making the, the payment. So you made a payment error, yes? Yes. They and pointed out the payment error. They pointed error. it out. And what, through my filters, what came to me yep. was when I opened the email, it felt like one of those telegrams that came through Harry Potter, delivered by the owl, <laughs> where the person was screaming at me saying, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. And, yep. and it was, and it just really, um, and I just didn't know what to do with that. And obviously, not being humble, I, 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 yeah, when you say you didn't know what to do with it, that's what I'd like to talk to you yeah, about. Yes, sure. because, because the reality is you did do a few things with it. Okay. <laughs> One of the things you did was you emailed back yeah. saying how you felt attacked and abused and it wasn't fair and, yeah. and, and you said a number of other things to them how they weren't loving to you and, and if they were like your celestial friends then they would have been loving and it wouldn't have been this hard. And, and, and so all they did was actually tell you a statement of truth, which was yeah. that you didn't pay the right amount, could you pay the right amount? And, and also that you hadn't obviously read something, otherwise you would have paid the right amount. Mm. And instead of admitting to a mistake, yeah. you then felt like you were just getting attacked by the persons who were trying to actually serve you. Yeah. And, and this is an issue with love that we wanted to raise with you. Yeah. Now, there was a, then a series of interactions, weren't there? There was an interaction with them, and then, of course, Mary and AJ, who were overseeing the <laughs> interactions, had an interaction with you. And, and in the process, there was a deep refusal to receive any personal truth, if you think about it. And in fact, there was so much refusal that initially we decided to not have you at the group. Yes. So it went that far that there was just so much blockage. And one of the things we said to you, was that if you're, that if you're refusing that much truth just in an email, then it's highly unlikely you were going to cope with being here. And, and then, after a little bit of time, I could feel that you obviously did work your way through some issues. And Mary and I then reconsidered the situation based on what I could feel you'd also felt through a bit. And so we then decided, well, no, let's make it the proviso is that you have to have this conversation with me to be here. <laughs> And, I, and so what, what I'm doing now is having that conversation with you. Okay. Now, a, a number of things come, come to mind in this interaction. Firstly, you felt like you were being attacked. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of just allowing yourself to process through that emotionally, you went on the attack. Yeah. You blamed, you also criticised, but you actually blamed and criticised someone that was actually serving you. So, so you weren't serving them, they were serving you. And they were doing it for free. 
They were doing it with no you know, expectation of financial reward or any other reward. Uh, they had already got a booking of their own into the assistance group, so they weren't even doing it for that reason. So it was something, it was a gift they were giving. And just because they had been specific with you and, you, and that emotion came up in you of feeling like, you know, that it was all, um, you'd made a mistake and you, that, that you didn't really want to admit to and, uh, and you didn't want to acknowledge and you, and you felt they should have told you in a better way. In other words, an addiction of how they tell you the truth was, was present. And so then you went back on the attack and told them a whole heap of things about themselves, about how they were unloving and unloving with you in the past and so forth and so forth and so forth. And of course, at some point, myself and Mary had to step in on the interaction as a result of that. And I was wondering whether you'd given much consideration as to what addictions were in play in that interaction. Could you, could you see, firstly, there was this addiction of wanting a person to bring something to your attention in the manner that you wanted them to? I was trying to control the, control the whole, the whole thing. thing. Yeah. And I wanted it to be done in a particular way, yeah. and I only wanted to be spoken in a particular way, yeah. and I didn't want to feel anything uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, and you didn't want... Uh, you, you didn't want just the truth to be presented to you. You wanted the truth with frills. I wanted <laughs> compassion. I wanted um, grace. I wanted yeah. the, the layers. I wanted the lot. Yeah. And compassion and grace is not actually compassion and grace that God's giving you at the moment. No. It's the kind of compassion and grace which is addictive and codependent, where, where you're actually seeking a certain type of response from the person. Yeah. So there's, there's that issue. Then the second issue comes in with Graham, okay. in that you're observing this interaction and obviously at some point you must have shared that there was something going wrong with the booking. Yep. Yep. Now what was your response to that? Um, not unlike Christiana's, yeah. she made... So you became indignant, did you a bit and... I've got to sort of stand up for the... You've got to stand up for your wife. Yeah, <laughs> she made a simple mistake and yeah. she's been really have it, have it yeah, and I think that's an injury I have too, and I've made what I consider simple mistakes, yeah. and someone's come down really hard on me, so I guess there was some sympathy So there. did both of you feel that, that Karen Page came down really hard on you? Yeah, Initially, yeah. 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 Uh, I think what really uh, triggered me from uh, is that Page said, Oh, was it Paige or Kerry? I'm not quite sure. Well, you wouldn't know which one because both of them had access to the email, yeah. right? <laughs> so um, that it was, you know, that in making the mistake, there was a lot more work that they had to do and, and whatever. And Does, I, We told them to say that. Yeah. So, that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just, you know. Yeah. And wh why do you think we told them to say that? To trigger me. No. No. <laughs> no. I don't know. Well, because the reality is you, you, are not, you weren't concerned about the extra work that you may put somebody through if you made a mistake. Like, the fact is that mistakes, the, the Mary had very clearly outlined all of the booking process in a document that was very, very clear to the majority of people, with the exception of one of those exceptions being yourself. Right, but for the majority of people, the, the, the booking process was very, very clear. And, and in your case, you decided to ignore some of the process, right? as did some other people, by the way, and they were also corrected. Um, so some people missed out, for example, their names on the booking process. Now, you imagine with, with 140 people making booking and you miss out the name, how do you now find out what, who this booking is for, what it's for, where does it go, and there's now a whole heap of additional work that has to happen. And we were saying to Paige and Kerry that anybody who causes you additional work hasn't thought about you. Huh? Yeah. Which is true. Yes. You weren't thinking about them at all. No. You were just thinking about your booking, and even then you weren't thinking about that clearly. And part of this problem is with money. And you know you've got problems with money. Yeah. You do things, You'll go around the world if you think the cause is good enough, right? Yeah. But if the cause isn't quite good enough, you then have a problem with money. Yeah. And this is, a, this is an interesting fact about your life as well, yeah. in that you, you're frequently worried about money, but, but you're using money as an excuse, actually, to be unloving. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Or you're using it as an excuse to, to control the entire flow of events. 
it was, the booking process was quite clear and the money needed was quite clear yeah. for each booking. And you ignored it somehow and you say you made a mistake. And I would like to raise that with you that actually I don't agree that you made a mistake. I felt that you didn't look enough at the instructions. I didn't. No. I didn't. And there was quite a number of people who didn't do that. Uh, and we corrected every one of them. Right? And not looking at the instructions of a, of a group of people who are giving you a gift before they even give you the instructions mm. is already a problem, can you see? Yeah. There's an expectation and demand in that. Yeah. So there's expectations and demands there. There's then the assumption that you're being heavily dealt with when it's just a mistake without the knowledge of how, how the mistake affects other people. So, you know, what, what, how it affects Paige and Kerry is they've now got to do a series of in emails when they wouldn't have had to do any at all. If you'd made the right booking with the right amount, with the right instructions, it would have been done, it would have been done and there would have been no further interaction whatsoever from their perspective. Yeah. But they had their email you back, and then you worsened the situation by attacking them, and now they emailed you back about the attack, and then we had to get involved, and then we emailed you back. Then you denied all of that as well, what we sent you, which was quite a lot of information. Yes. And, and then the whole thing escalates, right? Yeah. And with us, we get to the point where we say, enough's enough now. Yeah. We're giving a gift here. There's a direct refusal of the gift. Now, husband, run it, running to your rescue is an issue. You've already been unloving, you've been told you're being unloving by a person who you're learning about love from. So my suggestion is you begin to trust that person and there's not much trust in, in what I sent to you because I actually compiled the email in response and there wasn't much trust in any of what I said there. Right? And you felt I was being very hard now, right? And, uh, and, and yet I'm the person you were coming to learn about love from, and yet there was a direct refusal of any of that information. So my suggestion is, well, if there's a direct refusal about the information from the person who you're learning about love from, either that person is not worth learning love from anymore, right? Or there is an issue with resistance to truth and there's one or the other. Does that make sense? Now, if, if I can go on to you, so, and, and uh, perhaps I need to also mention the facade-based emotion, which was one of the problems that you face, where you try to pretty everything up rather than just feeling what you really felt, which was actually quite angry, yeah. if you're honest with yourself. The anger came through not only your email, but the feeling coming from yeah. you was quite intensely angry. But, but you didn't want to even acknowledge to yourself that you were that angry yeah. and so you put this facade words on it but the anger coming through the words is so strong already yeah. that naturally you know it wasn't going to go anywhere that way <laughs> in that direction yeah. now if i can talk to you going about the um the rushing to the woman's rescue mm -hmm. i put to you that the reason why you don't see many of the unethical and immoral things that go on for your wife in her day-to-day -day life is because you don't want to see them. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to see them because you've been trained to not see them by your mother and then by your wife. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You don't want to stand up for truth and love. You want to stand up for her. Yeah. And there's a big difference between standing up for truth and love and standing up for her. Yep. You see, if I had the attitude with Mary that I was going to stand up for her rather than standing up for truth and love, then automatically what that means is that both of us are going to be in the same condition forever. Yep. Because, because if, I, if I stand up for where she is now or she stands up for where I am now, we don't have a chance to progress. Mm. We need to uphold what is actually the ideal, the mm. truth and the ideal in terms of ethics and the ideal in terms of morality. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we look at this situation, someone's replied with the truth and with a statement that says you've now made extra work for us, which is also a truth, <laughs> right? You felt bad. You didn't want to feel bad. You didn't want her to feel bad. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? Yeah. So you didn't want her to feel bad. So what do you do? 
you uphold the error-based position rather than seeing the truth. Yes. That's where it all goes wrong. Yeah. Right? And many of our men in the audience here do the same thing. And so it's a priority. Truth and love take priority over unloving, untruthful facts. Exactly. Gotcha. And, and, and if you think about it, I go even further in, our relation, in my relationship with Mary. The way we treat our relationship is this. God's truth is paramount. Anything to do with truth is paramount. Anytime either one of us is in error, we always must address the other person. You know, so, so if I'm in error, Mary must take steps to address it. If, I, if she's in error, I must take steps to address it because for us, the truth is paramount. Now, that, doesn't, that means that I'm not trying to protect Mary's emotions and she's not trying to protect mine. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm not trying to make it all go away for her. I'm trying to help her expose the emotion and she's not trying to make it all go away for me. In fact, trying to make it go away is not helping Correct. her feel or me feel the emotion. Correct. It doesn't help for yourself, Christiana. Mm. It doesn't help you mm. see why, you're, why you want truth packaged in all these pretty ferals because that's an addiction. Mm. And, and it doesn't help you deal with the facade that you're in with regard to your anger. You know, it'd be far better if your husband said, you're just angry. <laughs> and when you're angry, you're not getting an addiction met. So what's the addiction, girl? <laughs> it would be far more powerful for him to say that to you than it would be go, yes, you're right. You know, this is a bit unfair. All we did was make a little mistake, it's, you know, and, and take it down that ro route that basically just harms you anyway because it doesn't expose the truth to you about, about what's going on emotionally. Does that make sense? And for yourself, Graham, what you're doing by pandering to the woman, you are automatically assisting her in this regard to be unethical. Yep. Uh, now, what do you think happens to your soul when you assist another person to be unethical? It must be great. It can't improve, can it? It can't, <laughs> can't improve. So, so this is why, how a lot of relationships remain the same for the rest of their lives. So they come together, they have something that brings them together, but there's also often codependency between the two in the relationship. And then what happens is the husband or the wife, and usually it's one or the other, there's one who holds the power in the relationship, and to be frank with you, that's you, Christiana, in yes. your relationship. You hold the power in the relationship. Graham has learnt to uphold your power and support you in all of your endeavours. And in a lot of ways, you've, you've learnt to do it to, to the suppression of your own desires and passions. But also, you've learnt that if... if if she's upset, you've got to make it better. You've got to, you've got to agree, firstly, because that, that isn't it. For every woman in the audience, how does a man make you feel good? He agrees with you, yes? Every time. No? Yes? Definitely. Most, most people in a relationship think that a real relationship is based on love means the other person will agree with them. <laughs> All the time. All the time. All the time. Right? Even when they're wrong they still got to agree with them. And there's a common joke in, in, in between men that goes, all you've got to say to make things better is, yes, dear, you're right. <laughs> right? And, uh, of course, that doesn't make things better. All it does is make both be in this codependent addiction and it supports the codependent addiction, so it's no good for the relationship. If you want to come together, if you are a soulmate couple and you want to come together, truth is the key. Truth is the key. And that's not your truth, and it's not your truth, it's God's truth that's yeah. the key. And that's going to mean that each of you honour God's truth first. So if you're angry with another person, if I honour God's truth, I go, yeah, you're angry with another person, that means that you have an addiction here that you've got to have a look at. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So rather than agreeing with you, which would be the opposite to that, to go you'd go, <laughs> yeah, you'd go, like, even if this person slapped you in the face, you're angry, so there's, yeah. you, there's some anger here. Here's the stick. Here's the stick. Go out there and belt the thing and don't use it on me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and if, if, if a person around you did that, then you have a higher potential to progress. Right? If a person feeds your addiction, there's no higher potential to progress. Now, initially what happens in a relationship when a person does this is that there is conflict because one or the other or both resist the process of truth. But the only way to establish any loving relationship is truth. 
So that's where it's got to go. Now, what I would do, uh, my recommendations for you, Graham, is have a look at the childhood addictions that were established by, the, by your relationship with your mother and how she treated you. So how did your mother treat you? Well, my recollection is that I was treated OK. You OK, know. yes. Well, as how long as I... Well, as I long as? I was a good boy. Correct. What did she define as a good boy? I did what she wanted. Exactly. Yeah. A good boy always does what mummy wants. Yes. Right? That's how, you, that's how you became a good boy, right? Yep. So you're a lovely good boy that yes. another woman can find, right? And basically do the same thing with you, treat you like a good boy. And as long as you do exactly what that person wants, you will be treated like you're a good boy and you'll even get some sex occasionally if you yes. do that, right? Yeah. Or love. Or love. Mm -hmm. But for many men, sex is love. Mm -hmm. right? And we often do things because we're worried about the lack of sexual intimacy. Yeah. yeah. When you no longer uh, agree with the woman, what happens to sexual intimacy then? Falls apart. Falls apart. And so you've learnt to, to agree with a woman, you're going to have some sexual intimacy. If you don't agree with a woman, no sexual intimacy. And you like sexual intimacy when you know you've got control. That's a big issue for, for, um, for me mm. and for us. Yeah. 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 So oftentimes uh, in, the, in a relationship like this, you'll, there'll be when the woman's feeling in power and control, then there's sexual intimacy. But when she's feeling like now the relationship's getting a bit out of control, the man's not as uh, you know, compliant, then there's no sexual intimacy. And it's a, it's, a, it's a stick used to punish the man for his being a bad boy. Yeah. Right? And then on top of that, what happens is the man goes, yes, uh, it feels really bad now there's no sexual intimacy because that's the addiction. And so now you're going to be a good boy again yeah. to get back the sexual intimacy. Yeah. 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 So these dynamics play out quite a lot in the relationship if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Now the, the way to challenge all of that, and my suggestion is over the next few days have a look at a few se separate things. Firstly tomorrow, no, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, Mary remind me where is she? That's right, yes. Thanks, darling. She's away there behind someone. Understand is to understanding self. Now now the second the second part tomorrow, which I'll be handling, is called deconstructing the facade. Yes. Alright. Now that needs to happen in the relationship. So both need to look at deconstructing the facade in the relationship. So that's number one. I'd recommend you have a good listen to that talk and just see what's going on there in terms of the facade. Then the next day there are, um, there's, a, there's a series of talks that Corneli Cornelius and Mary are giving which are about addictions. And Mary's giving, uh, Cornelius giving one called Challenging Addictions and Mary, uh, sorry, called Recognising Addictions and Mary's giving one called Challenging Addictions. My suggestion is have a good look at how to challenge these addictions that are in the relationship. When both of you agree in the relationship, it's very hard to challenge the addiction because you actually feel supportive of the addiction. Does that make sense? And you want him to support the addiction so that everyone's happy. So there's a seeming happiness right, in the relationship, but, but it's not real because it's just based on codependent addictions. So that, that'd be the two days I'd be focusing on for you guys. Now, for yourself, separately. Mm -hmm. The next day I'm going through what are called repentance and forgiveness relationships. The relationship you had with Kerry and Paige I would classify as a repentance relationship. Yeah. It's where you did something to someone else that they did not deserve yeah. and therefore you need to go through the process of repentance. Yeah. That's very different to a forgiveness relationship which is a type of relationship you have with your mother or your father. Right? They, where they cause damage to you. Now what you tried to imply in your emails to Kerry and Paige was that they had caused damage to you when they had not. Right? And you tried to imply that you caused no damage to them. So you actually had reversed the whole situation. 
you tried to imply that they needed to repent and you needed to forgive them. And in fact, you did use those words, I forgive you for your bad behaviour, basically, is what you said to them. And, and this is where all of your concepts of forgiveness and repentance are completely the opposite to how they should be. So my suggestion is have a good look at that presentations and I'm doing those presentations that day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Do I have any repentance for backing Christiana? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Every person who supports another person mm. in their unloving behaviour automatically has a law of compensation effect on their soul for doing so. Mm. You're basically approving of and supporting behaviour that's unloving because you don't have the courage to do anything differently. Does that make sense? So, that, so, so imagine if, for a moment, if let's let's take the behaviour to an extreme. Mm -hmm. Let's say, let's say, Christiana wanted to murder somebody. Yeah. Would you approve of her then? Uh -huh. Right. So you wouldn't approve of her under those circumstances. I'm let's say, sure no. let's say she wanted to have an abortion. Knowing what I now now know. Now in what you now know. I would not approve of that. You'd not approve of that. No. So how are you going to voice this disapproval and still maintain a nice sexual relationship with your wife? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's one issue we're going to because because you can see how your addiction to maintain that relationship would cause you to contemplate support. Yes. Or or not say anything. Not say anything. Or not say anything. And just say or say something like Or it's your decision. It's your decision. Yeah. Or right. something like got that. I, I got nothing to do with that type of thing. When no, you're the father, you do yeah. have something to do with that type of thing. So can you see, even on the extreme, which is the murder extreme, mm. there is the potential of bending to the behaviour if that behaviour is warranted by her for some reason. Mm. Right? But let's now make tone down that behaviour. Let's say she feels somebody else has treated her badly when they have not. Yeah. Which is the situation that happened yes. here with Patient <laughs> Kerry. You were then very willing to support her behaviour. Right? And that is an issue of ethics. Yeah. See, I could not ethically support Mary's bad behaviour yeah. with anybody, even if it was against my worst enemy. Because yeah. right? bad behaviour is Because bad behaviour is unloving. Yeah. And it also harms our soul. And we're, and we're soulmates, so it's harming our soul, bad, yeah. this bad behaviour. Mm. We won't be able to ever join together. We won't be able to ever be at one with God while this bad behaviour continues. Mm. And there's a reason for the bad behaviour that I'd love her to find. And, and she's not going to find it if I don't point it out. And she doesn't want me to point it out. We're not going to get anywhere with that. Yeah. Right. So you can see how the whole thing just keeps perpetuating. Correct. As I support mm. and... As you support, mm. there's the damage that's done to your own soul, mm. but there's also the damage and the enabling, if you like, done to the other person. You're enabling their behaviour. And one of the things I learned in, in, one of, in a prior relationship that I had before Mary, in, in a, with the marriage that I, that I was in, it was my first relationship, was that I was constantly enabling the poor behaviour of my wife. And once I realised I was doing that, I realised that I was... I was partially culpable for everything she did because I had a tacit or active approval of everything she did by supporting her. Mm. Now, if I had upheld instead, upheld God's principles in every case, then I would bear no responsibility for any of that support because yeah. I wouldn't be supporting her. Yeah. I'd, every time I say, no, I can't support that, yeah. I'd actually be confronting the relationship. But like you... I wanted some emotional intimacy. So the addiction for emotional intimacy caused me to throw away the ethics. And if you do that, you can't get closer to God and, I, and also you can't get closer to your partner. Yeah. You're not going to get closer to each other doing that either. Yeah. Does that make sense? And, and the reason why I brought those things up with you guys is because this is what I observe a lot in many people. They have a relationship where often it's the wife who has the power in the relationship. And this is something that, um, you know, there's many in our audience where the wife does actually have the power in the relationship. And he does what she wants and he is willing to break principles of ethics and morality in order to do what she wants. 
in order to get his addiction met of having some emotional intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, as, I mean, interested to how do we just get the balance of power back to being equal and just. There's no such thing as a balance of power. And, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that Graham is enabled with his free will and I'm enabled with my free will and that we can share, the, share a space together. So. Yeah, see, I find that as a natural place, when you are both living in harmony with truth, this is what automatically happens. Okay. And, and also, if you are soulmates, you will f find yourself drawn together once you allow that to happen. If you're not, then you'll find yourself uh, apart mm. and fi you'll find your soulmates in that process. But, but if you're a soulmates, you will find yourself being drawn together by the truth itself, by both of you living in harmony with the truth, with each other and with, by, with yourselves. Yeah. And, uh, and can I just address this issue of power? Because yes. it is a big issue for, my, for a lot of relationships. Yeah. And there is no such thing as power in a relationship that's loving. No, no such thing. And in fact, a person who truly loves does not want to take power over another person. So you wouldn't even ask the question, how do I get balance? Because there is actually balance is automatic once you get rid of the concept of power. Now, why does the concept of power exist? It's because you want control. Why do you want control? Because you're afraid. So all control-based power situations all come from a fear of something. So what are you afraid of in your relationship? Um, not being loved. Yes. Yep. But the irony is at the moment that this man could love you, you know, to the, to, to the perfect degree and in fact you would feel less loved. Because actually Paige and Kerry loved you more than he does by telling you the truth, frankly and openly and straightforwardly, without addiction and without wanting something in return. They didn't need anything in return from you. They did all of that in a much more loving space than when you normally say anything to your wife because you're, you're wanting something in return, which is yeah. this, which is this oh, codependent yeah. feeling. And I actually feel not loved when he's placating me. There's, there's some, when he's not telling me the truth, I. I have a feeling of... Yeah, this is where you've got to be very careful because yeah. what, what you've done is you've assisted his development. Yeah. You liked what he was doing in, beginning, in the beginning. Yeah. You like this kind of man who placates and gives you what you want, does what you want, does yeah. what you tell him to do. You like that. It was a big change from... Um, from previous, previous relationship, yes. I thought that was... You thought that was love, right? So you wanted that right at the beginning. Right? And now you're not happy with it. And he's just trying to do the same thing he's always done. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, but yes, there will be a time when you become more sensitive and you go, oh, wow, yeah, this is not the real person I'm getting. This is just a person who is feeding me stuff that they want to feed me because they think that that's what I want from them. Yeah. Yeah. But you've also got to see your part in the creation of that. Yes, yeah, sure. Because you married him for that reason. <laughs> I do. Yeah, and there is the repent. The, this is the repentance relationship. You need to repent for the fact that you wanted him like this, yeah. not blame him for the fact that he's like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's there's a big and this is where Tuesday's discussion is going to confront a lot of people, because you're going to be looking at wow, the th things I thought I should be forgiving people for, I should be repenting for, and. and the things I thought that they should be repenting for, I should be forgiving them for, you know, things like that. So you, you will find all of your world with regard to that probably turned upside down yeah. with regard to that discussion. So it's one of my addictions in coming together with Christiana and marrying her, yep. trying to fix all the problems that were in her life. Yeah, partly, yeah. And what, why? Why? Oh, so I'd get love. Or, well, you uh, think about your relationship with your mother. Oh, I, I would get her love or I wouldn't be smacked. Yeah, you'd be a good boy. If I fix everything. If you fix everything, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So you start, so a lot of men in this situation start seeing themselves as the solution to all women's problems. Yes. He was yeah, going to be the hero. Yeah, they're the hero of all oh, women. I love you know? being the hero and fixing <laughs> yeah. things. Look what I've done. Yeah, look what I've, I've done. It's amazing. Right? The knight on the white shining armour. Yeah, type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and actually, all it is is a codependent addiction that was established with your mother and has been perpetrated then upon every relationship since. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's not, it's not a love-based thing. No. Yeah. 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 There's much more we could talk about, obviously. <laughs> but uh, it's I think there's a good start there. Yeah. And be careful of judging and thinking that other people who are just telling you the truth are actually not loving you. Yeah. And be careful of thinking that the people who aren't telling you the truth <laughs> are loving you. Right? When I say, like, aren't telling you the truth, what I mean by that is who are addictively having an interaction with you so that they get your approval, it might feel all nice and warm and fuzzy. Yeah, it feels yucky to me now. Oh, well, I can't agree. Yeah. Because you had the opposite interaction with Paige, Paige and Kerry, where there was no warm and fuzzies. Yeah. Right? And what happened? Yeah. It quickly escalated into, like, a bit of a slanging match, right? Yeah. 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 So that's an indication that you are addicted to that. So the, you, can, you can't then blame Graham for giving you that when the person who did not give it to you, you abused. Yeah. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is where you have to be careful. Yeah. You say to me that you, you don't yeah. like that from him anymore, but your behaviour proves that you yeah, actually do, do like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Of course, there is some knowledge now through the truth you've learnt that, that you're not getting the real him. But you want the real him to be, do, be able to do this to you all the time, to give you what you want, but you want it to be real. And I'm saying, no, it's not going to ever be like that. Once he's real, no you will be there'll be no addictions met. Yeah. That's once he's real, there'll be no addictions met. What's that going to feel like for you? Awful. Yeah, you're going to feel it's not love anymore. Yeah. Right? Which, in actual fact, it was love. When in actual fact it is love. Yeah. And that's what I felt in finally after I was started coming through the other side. Yeah. What I felt was when you were giving me the truth and, um, and pa pa Carrie and Paige was giving me truth and the two last emails, I actually felt more love in that process. I felt safer than I've ever felt before yeah. because I, I could feel what you were trying to give to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though it was hard to receive, yeah. yeah. Now, there's one other uh, thing I wanted to address with you, and that is your so-called connection with your spirit guides. Yeah. I have said very clearly to you yeah. that you do not have a connection, both of you do not have a connection with your celestial guides, and both of you still continue to want to believe you do. Yeah. Can I suggest to you, your, your celestial guides are with you. You do have celestial guides. Yeah but you cannot feel them at the moment because you're in so much codependent addiction, you cannot feel them. Yeah. And what's happening is other spirits are stepping in claiming to be your guides yeah. who are manipulating you through the words and you just trust the words because you cannot feel them. Yeah. Because a person who's really in truth with you, you believe they're being hard with you, you yeah. believe they're being harsh. Yeah. And a person who's being nice to you is a person who's in an addiction with you. Yeah. And, okay. and the spirits who you are speaking with are the spirits who are in complete addiction with you. Yeah. Right? And you call them your celestial guides because they give you nice warm fuzzies, I if since, I can call them that. I've found out the, a lot more truth about that. So. Yeah. yeah. And they, they give you a nice feeling and you're addicted to those feelings. So this is another indication that the addictions are very strongly desired. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You really badly want these addictions met. And, and so it's very, very important that you, you start seeing that you, those addictions are even in play with the interactions you're having with spirits as well. Yeah. And you want to please her with the messages that you give. Can they still deliver some truth? Um, they it will depends only... what level... Well, it depends where they are, but, yeah. but the ones that are connected to both of you are not in, 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 they're in the first sphere. So they're, not so they're in the same location you're in, basically. Yeah. Right? So they, they are not going to be able to give you any additional truth of what you already know. They can feed you a lot of things you want to hear, yeah. which is what they are doing. Yes. And you prefer to hear that. Yeah. So they'll, they'll let you also hear things that they know about you that are not going to affect their relationship with you. Yeah. In other words, they want the relationship with you to be established and firm. 
They don't want you to deal with any emotions that would cause a break in their relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So they're happy to have you deal with all these emotions that you might have that won't affect your relationship with them. But as soon as there's an emotion coming up that will affect the relationship with them, instantly angry. Mm -hmm. And they actually invite you into their anger, mm -hmm. which is why you became resentful from Paige and Kerry's email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, um, during one of the... the um Guidances, guidances that we had, they commented about Kerry's behaviour. So, and that's influenced me quite dramatically. Yeah, they inflamed, they inflamed, inflamed. the situation. They did. Yeah, and they knew that they would inflame the situation because it would connect to certain grievances that you have from the past inside of you. Yeah. And they purposefully inflamed the situation. Yes. Right? Because that's where they wanted it to go. And that's an indication that they were not celestial spirits. Yeah. And in fact, they're not even second sphere spirits. Yeah. Because it, uh, even a second sphere spirit would not attempt to inflame a situation. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sure. So, so this is where you need to be very careful. Yeah, and really. there's many others in our audience that need to take the same care. We had a big, big lesson on that one. Yeah. So, and, and we just haven't and, um, done anything since. So. You see, I, that's not the approach I would take. <laughs> well, well, it's up to, I mean, it's up to Graham, because he, Graham He's the doing, one doing the mediumship. Doing yeah. the mediumship, and yeah. I've just had a little bit of a try and, and everything, but I'm still, but, um, you know, it's up to Graham to... Yeah, the, the first approach I would take is I'd talk to these spirits. Yes. You now know what's going on with them. Yeah. So talk to them about the fact that they wanted to inflame the situation. Why did they feel that way? You know that's now an indication that they weren't, they're not celestial spirits as they're claiming, so who are they really? Mm. Have a chat with them. Mm. Work yeah. out what their motivations are. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that yeah. may help them as well as us? Well, it may do, but bear in mind they've already lied to you, so there's a likelihood they might lie again. Oh, okay. And when you feel they're lying, you say, I feel you're lying. So just yeah. be honest. Just be honest. Yeah. 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 But don't trust people you cannot see the condition of. Yeah. yeah. And that's really hard with, you know, when you're just not able to feel and... and Correct. And, um, you know... So, so if a person is not able to feel, it's very, very hard for to them to learn image. who to trust. Yeah. 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 And this is why it's in, uh, one of the imperatives to feeling, like, yeah. certainly. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So that, the other things I'd have a look at in the what's coming up in the next few days. Okay. We'll talk more with some other people about this, uh, the codependent addictions that happen in relationships. And Corny, when he's, Cornelius, when he's doing the talk about recognising addictions, in re he's going to call it recognising addictions in relationships. Mm. He's, he's going to try to help connect you to the feelings that indicate the addiction is present. Mm. So you'll be able to recognise those addictions that are in the relationship. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. That wasn't too painful, was it? <laughs> Not nearly as painful as, <laughs> as you're expecting. Yeah. Now, when you're truly repentant for your behaviour, you'll probably want to take some action with Kerry and Paige, which will be different than the action you've already taken. Yeah, sure. I, I get overwhelmed and I just don't know what to do in a lot of. But yeah, see, uh, I feel. Again, I don't know whether I could agree with that. Um, a lot of times we do know what love would do. Yeah. We just feel embarrassed know. about doing it or we feel like humiliated doing it or we feel a lot of other emotions about doing it. So we tell ourselves we don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Like what would you, if, if, if I had harmed you what, would you, what would you think would be the way I could undo that harm? Well, a feeling it, a feeling and being aware of what I actually, what my actions were, yeah. uh, what the actions were. Yeah. And so, then, so that's a personal process for me. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then once I came to a feeling of um, remorse and repentance. Um, yeah. So then, true remorse. Yeah. True me remorse. Yeah. Um, then I would make uh, make take action to contact that person to to. Um, and what say they said, oh, I don't believe you, what would you do then? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I, I no, that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm asking. You see, most people don't know. Mm. 
Mm. Most people don't know, so you don't have to feel <laughs> bad about that. See, I, I feel it's quite clear if, you, if I now ask you from a different perspective, what would you expect of me if I'd harmed you? Well, expect, expecting would be unloving, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. Let's, uh, I mean, let's, I'm let's just say, rather than demands and expectations that they, they do something. Um, um, so well, let's say I'd been unloving to you. Well, it would be. Um, what would you What would you observe in me if I was truly repentant? Do you feel um, humility? Um, so I'd acknowledge that I'd done the harm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What else? Um, I would talk to them and tell them what I was feeling. What you? Were, what they were? Oh, sorry, I'm getting confused as to. Like I've done the harm here. Oh, you've done the harm. I've done that. Uh, um, uh, to show a true remorse, a, a true feeling that you've done something. So, what's a true remorse in your book? That you wouldn't do it again. Um, Right. How, how can you guarantee that? Um, uh, process with God. But, and how can you guarantee that I wouldn't do it oh, again? No, I don't know. I, I can't. You wouldn't. There must be a way. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and this is with the kind of things I want to go through with everyone on Tuesday. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because mo most of us have no idea, really, what yeah. we're expecting. A lot of times we expect some addiction in return. We expect them to go bow to us and go, oh, I'm terrible, it's terrible, mm -hmm. I, what can I do? You know, when a lot of that can be just a facade. We, we don't know when somebody's really sorry and when, compared to when they're not really sorry. We've got no idea mm -hmm. a lot of the times. Because the reality is, usually in our life, there's been very few people that have ever been really sorry for anything they've done towards us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And so no, none of us really have much of an experience with it. Does that, that make sense? And also, there's been very few examples of repent of forgiveness in our life, and so none of us really have much of an idea how to do that either. And what I loved about Mary's talk today was that uh, she focused on, we're strengthening the will to love, right? And she was focusing on, there's some things you can do to strengthen this will to love. Yeah. There's, there's actions you can take to strengthen the desire to love. And I, I love the focus of the difference between it being willpower and you know the will itself coming from the soul, the desire coming from the soul. The only way you can guarantee that someone is really forgiving or repentant is there has to be some feelings coming from their soul yeah. that demonstrate that. And very few of us have, have had an example of that and very few of us personally do it. And that's why we have no knowledge about it. And one of the things Mary said today was the most important thing we can learn about is love. So if we treat this week as right, these are all good lessons in love. Though. These are new things we need to learn about love. It's like having a bit of a love boot camp type of thing. Or, or it's a, should we say it's one tiny week of many, many year semesters <laughs> in the training course about love that we need to go through. And, and if we remember that, and if you remember that, you will then come out, hopefully, on Tuesday of going, OK, a person who's truly repentant will, and you'll have some feelings about what that will be, what, what will go on with a person that's truly repentant. Yeah. And you'll also know what the feelings will be associated with a person who's truly forgiving yeah. as well. Do yeah. you feel it in your soul? Sorry? You'll feel it in your soul from their soul? Yes, but that of course requires that your soul is very open to the and feeling. And sensitive. And sensitive. And that means that if you're in codependent addiction, it's highly unlikely that you are sensitive to those feelings. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, very hard for a person in codependent addiction to actually know when a person is truly sorry. Mm -hmm. They're going to think that a person bowing to them and pleasing them is sorry. And that's yeah. not the case in most mm -hmm. cases. Because mm -hmm. that's meeting an addiction. Correct. Yeah. 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 You see, we're so focused on meeting the addictions that, that we just believe that anybody who meets our addictions loves us. Yeah, uh, yeah they love us. Yeah, they love us. Yeah. Yeah. They did something nice for me today. They made me feel good today. They love us. I cried a lot when Mary was doing her delivery and just the, the fact that we've never been taught, taught about love. We just don't know. 
Correct. And we haven't yeah. had any role models, we haven't had any, we don't know what it looks like or feels like or Correct. sounds like. Correct. And yeah. we're just sometimes just left clueless. We are, but we've got to take one more, th there's got to be one more statement to this. Yeah. We've also not had a desire to know. You see? Yeah. And, and this is, you see, see, we can say all of what you just said, and I agree with all of what you just said, but we've also got to face the fact that we have never sat down and gone, I actually, I want to know what this is all about, what love is really all about. I know that I'm clueless. I've know, I know I've never had a role model. I know that I've never had an example of repentance or forgiveness in my entire life. I know all of these things, that, but I want to know. Most of us don't get to that point. We go, instead, we go, oh, I like this addiction stuff. I'm just going to fit in with what everybody else does with addictions. Yeah. And, and so we conform to the same behaviour that we're condemning in others. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to be very careful. So yes, while you are right, you know, we've never had a role model, we've never been taught, we have never had a university degree in love, you know. You know, if, if, if schools were done differently, the, the first thing you would learn is about love. Because everything else you have to learn is all going to need love as a basis to learn it. Mm. Uh, if you want to learn about the environment, well, you need to know how to love it. Mm. You, you need to know how everything fits together in love. If you want to learn about relationships, you need to know about love. If you want to learn about humanity, if you want to learn about your body, you've got to know about love of yourself, love of others, how those two things affect your body. Mm. You've got to know everything about love first. So the very first course that should be on the planet when it comes to schooling should be, you know, grade five, uh, sorry, five years old, grade one, or what do we call it, reception, grade one. The reception is introduction to love. Grade one is becoming a loving individual. Grade two is, <laughs> you know. And by the time we get to grade two, three, four, we've now got a big basis of love. Now you can introduce mathematics, introduce science, introduce economics, introduce all sorts of te te really technical things. And because the person's open to love, they can absorb it all so rapidly that by the time they were 10, they'd have a university degree in science as well as uh, an understanding of love. Yeah. Right? We'll put the two together. Well, well it was always together. Yeah. That's, the, that's the reality. But, but that kind of world is still a way off, mm. unfortunately. Yeah. And it's going to need some people really wanting to learn about love to create that kind of a world. Yeah. 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 Thanks for your time, guys. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank Thanks for you. being brave for coming up. <laughs> And uh, we won't do any more tonight, but I think my next one is Dave, isn't it? Is that right? Dave, uh, David Wall? Yes. yes. You're okay with that? Yeah. You reckon that it's sort of okay with you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. So um, we, we will be doing, I'll just say to the, to the people watching in the camera, the, we will be doing these kind of uh, chats with people uh, quite frequently over the coming months because we feel it's really important for people to start seeing the practical aspects of divine truth in their day-to-day -day life rather than just uh, being able to ignore it, you know. But the problem, with, the problem with having presentations given to you over and over again is that you only take what you want to take. And most of the time, what you want to take is totally driven by your addictions. <laughs> so, so, so naturally, you sit here and go, yeah, that was wonderful, that was wonderful. Oh, I didn't like that very much, so that went in one ear and out the other. And, and that went in one ear and out the other. And that one, no, I don't want that one. That's, you know, that's AJ's crazy ideas, get rid of those. And, and we ignore most of it, and we only accept what our addictions will accept. And uh, what, we, what these sessions we're hoping to achieve in is to help people get beyond that place where they start to see things that are really going on and the effects of them in their life rather than just, you know, accept, accepting the things that they can accept. Because the reality is if we continue just accepting the things we can accept, we're not going to make any changes. Yeah, so I'd like to thank you for helping me do that. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your bravery. <laughs>